speaker is Gabrielle Cuchelon. She's a postdoc in the Fisher Lab in Harvard Medical School, studying the biologic inhibitor injuring neurons and how they are specializing for cortical circuits. And we'll hear her talk on um, the organization and developmental establishment of cortical interneuron stress synaptic circuits. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So basically, uh, I look at in the Fisher lab at interneurons. So basically, also the collex like Andy, uh, but the inhibition there, not excitatory neurons, and also at later time points where they actually form circuits. Because if you can see from this very basic Harlequin representation, we actually built a sensory representation and then sensory motor skills when we can represent the world. And this happens because indeed neurons differentiate in a very specialized way. But in addition to migration, we have also specialization in terms of circuits and what they receive and how they form that. So this is where I'm going now uh, to actually integrate sensory perception and then create a cognitive uh, functions based on this integration, uh, information is actually processed within the neocortex into discrete, discrete, discrete cortical areas. So for example, we have uh, visual inputs that is received in primary visual cortex V1 or some other sensory system in S1. And we also have a higher function in this M2 a cognitive area where actually motor planning take, takes place here. And the units of neurons that are actually uh, supporting the flow of information in those cortical areas or the neurons. And as Andy was telling you, we have uh, the majority of excitatory neurons that is represented by these gray pyramidal cells, but then there are also 20% of GABAergic inhibitory neurons that uh, shape the flow of information. And they're very diverse, but they each provide canonical motif of inhibition to specialize the circuits and gate properly the flow of information. And here I'm interested in two types that together represent the biggest proportion of interneurons in the cortex. And in addition, they're born from the same structure, uh, progenitor structures, but they differentiate into those very distinct uh, interneurons. PV interneurons first provide for fit forward inhibition by receiving this strong thalamic input and then uh, sending this inhibition to the cortex, while SST interneurons provide feedback inhibition by receiving a lot of cortical inputs. So this raised the question of how the circuits are built. First, are those uh, motif of inhibition uh, true in every of those areas, but also thalamus and cortex are very gen generic terms, and they are actually subdivided in functional population. So how is this specific organization? So what I will show you is that first, uh, it's actually this specific circuit is not strongly uh, canonical in those different areas. They're actually uh, the afferents to SST and PV interneurons are first uh, defined by the areal location. Then we do see specific SST versus PV specificity in the way they integrate those uh, afferents from in, within an area. And last, I will very quickly give you uh, a bit more of mechanism into how activity and molecular uh, pathways actually allow for the integration of those afferents. So the way I looked at that is first by actually looking at um, uh, the, the afferents onto PV and SST cells use rabies tracing. So this is possible by targeting with AAV uh, helpers to the rabies in the specific population of interest. And then rabies would target specifically this population and allow for the monosynaptic retrograde labeling. And this is possible for PV and SST uh, with Cree line. First, we could use SST Cree that you can see here allows for the recombination of the helpers in uh, at early stages as well as uh, adult ones. However, for PV, that was a bit more complicated because PV is actually uh, allowing the recombination only late. So to target early circuits, uh, the early PV to target the circuits, we actually designed an intersectional strategy in which I uh, recombine the helpers into the progenitors of both populations with LHX6 Cree, and then uh, removed uh, the helpers from SST using SST flip recombinase and allow only for the expression in predative PV. And this worked very nicely, allowing for the exact co localization with parvalbumin later on, so targeting the PV early cells uh, in, in the cortex. So what we could do is trace the PV cells early in development then, as early as P5, to look at the rabies retrograde labeling uh, in the P5, P10 window, and then compare with an adult time points. And I did that for then both PV and SST within those three distinct areas I was mentioning to see how those afferents are built. Uh, 
And here I'm showing you an example of rabies tracing because after I'm gonna talk a lot about degree of connectivity and no more the images directly. But you can see how it looks like now where you have the local injection of helpers and rabies in which each red cell is actually representing the retrograde living neurons to the starter population, uh, uh, which are in green with the helpers. And you also see long range projection neurons such as here in the thalamus where uh, those neurons were retrograde labeled by targeting directly the population. And we also collaborated with the COSA lab to actually define an automated method to quantify the neurons and uh, see the distribution of this uh, uh, afferents. So for example, you see the starter cell here in S1 region, and you can see for the retrograde labeling here that the neurons are actually um, uh, found in many uh, discrete R regions of the cortex. So to actually find what region and what neurons are projecting to PVNSST, we then looked at within this retrograde labeling and aligned the uh, sections to an atlas. And from this atlas, we could define each population of neurons projecting to PVNSST. So for example, what I was telling you for the cortex, this is very generic, but we actually have very uh, distinct subregion within the cortex, such as the cingulates ACA here or M2, M1, that we could uh, quantify for the number of neurons projecting to PVNSST. There is, this is the case as well for the thalamus with different nucleus from the thalamus projecting to PVNSST. And we also have other subcortical regions that I'm not gonna talk much about today. So this is how we represent the result and how it looks like. So we traced the PV and SST interneurons into those three distinct regions. And what we expected from what we know in terms of functional circuits is that PV received a lot of thalamic inputs and then SST received a lot of cortical inputs to provide feedback inhibition. And this is the representation as a heat map of the degree of connectivity from each of those regions we found in the brain to project to either PV and SST within those each region. And if we divide those subregion into those groups, cortex, thalamus, I was telling you, and this is the others, we actually don't see very strong patterns towards PV versus SST. Actually, uh, this is way more complex than that. You can see from that heat map, and if we do an unsupervised clustering of all these areas, we actually see that PV and SST are way closer within one area than uh, another PV, for example, into another area. And this is confirmed with the correlation plot from the person correlation where you can see that they strongly correlate when they are within one area. So what about how cell types specifically target uh, within those areas, those afferents? So if we see again that canonical circuits, we expected that local cortex would specifically target SST. And here you can see here, this is really the case in M2, but this is actually not the case in S1 and V1. And similarly, if we look at other cortical input, you can see that we have a distribution in how strongly they connect to cortical areas. So basically, what we think now from this model is that PV and SST are not strongly segregated in terms of afferent they receive, but they actually regulate the type of cortical their input they receive, depending where it comes from. And this is the same in the thalamus. We don't have a strong bias of thalamus to PV at all from this cortical map. Instead, we can see that they receive distinct thalamic inputs within one area that they're gonna regulate differentially. And if we classify those neurons based on their function, we have limbic first and higher order thalamic inputs. And those different functions, if we classify them, uh, they actually have distinct profile of projection functionally in the cortex. And if we look at them within one area of S1 thalamic input, for example, they actually differentially are integrating onto PV and SST. And here we quantify the whole proportion of first and higher order. And we can actually see that PV receive more of this first order type of inputs from the thalamus, while SST has a balance of the two of them. So that we suggest that PV and SST regulates the afferents that are coming into one area specifically in a different way. And we confirm that by looking at the development in which we can see different dynamics in uh, the way they regulate a common input. So we found, for example, late dynamics of how uh, the input's gonna be integrated. When we have a progression with more here controllable inputs coming onto PV, uh, while for SST, you can see that this is not as strongly happening. So we have a lot of control maturing later. We also have early dynamics 
in here where it's again different between PV and SST with more local cortex projecting to PV early on. And they don't look like in minority uh, compared to the rest of connectivity later on, while SST just keeps maturing. And the last interesting one is also transitory a connectivity with the subplate that is mostly absent in adults, but you can see strongly connect PV and SST early on with also distinct amount. So those dynamics are different between the cell type depending in what area they are. And this is the same for the thalamus. Here, this is in S1, but we have seen that they integrate different thalamic input differentially. PV receive more first order, while SST have an equivalent balance between the two. But early on, PV has the same ratio, while SST actually have gradually acquired the first order neurons. They first driven by first order. So if I summarize this, we can see that both PV and SST start with the same type of input from the thalamus driven by first order mostly. But later on, SST gonna balance the type of input between first and higher order, while PV in sensory area will maintain that ratio. So we looked at that in visual cortex when we see the same trend. However, what's interesting is that while SST always look alike, PV in M2 actually receive a balance between first and higher order. So what we think it suggests is that SST that looks alike in all areas, maybe by its identity, postsynaptically regulates the thalamic afferents in their own way. While PV that looks different in the different areas probably uh, is affected by the presynaptic input, specifically that we know at those time points, the uh, PV cells receive uh, um, sensory experience that we know shapes the, the cortical circuits. So probably activity could regulate the thalamic input. And this is something we look like, we look at. So does the thalamic and presynaptic activity would regulate the afferents onto PV? And so we check that by looking at how uh, whisper deprivation would affect the, uh, the, the division between first and higher order. And actually, when we actually deprive the whiskers to the pups, we notice that PV doesn't receive that primary drive from the first order anymore. They actually look like they are in M2 where they don't receive sensory activity. Uh, so this is the summary of that. And so PV afferents, thalamic afferent, are affected by sensory experience. And SST, normal balance between first and high order, was not affected. So we believe that SST that actually have the same division everywhere could regulate those afferents based on their identity. So we found one in which we have um, receptors that could regulate the way the afferents come in. This is mglo one and GLUR1 is specifically expressed in SST cells very nicely. So what we did, and this is very preliminary, uh, but I think it's very interesting is that we actually using CRISPR strategy, delete the MGLUR1 expression as early as birth, uh, and then looked at how the first and higher order or uh, organized onto SST. And we actually see uh, more first order neurons to SST uh, when we delete for MGLUR1. So probably MGLUR1 postsynaptically is able to regulate the afferents coming in. So to summarize, we basically have a mechanism in which thalamic, uh, presynaptic input and here thalamus are defined depending early on, depending on the area they project. And then postsynaptically, the somatostatin interneurons here would regulate the way this input comes, while PV interneurons are actually affected by activity. So we think our presynaptic activity regulates those afferents, while for mglur one we have a postsynaptic effect. Uh, so I think that goes well with the idea of cell autonomous versus non-cell autonomous ID that Andy was describing, uh, and we'd like to push you that. So now I just want to finish by thanking the Fisher Lab, obviously, our collaborators in the COSA Lab, or uh, Kim at Janilia Farm, and thank you for your attention. Sorry. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of time. We have uh, two minutes for questions. Um, so I understand that this is uh, pending publication, right? You're waiting. It's, it's in bioarchive right now. So yeah, in yeah. Revision. Yeah, so the, the not yet, actually. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Uh, the M group, the postsynaptic part is very preliminary. It's something that we try to investigate now. So this is not part of the no. bioarchive. Yeah, yeah, the one before. Yeah, exactly. Everything else is, yeah. Okay, great. Good luck with that. And mm -hmm. we're moving on to the last uh, 